Mike, has it been just as rough and off-season it as it has been for Deep Space Nine? Uh... <laughs> what happened to you? The cat! What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. We have been off for a week while we transition from season five, but folks, we are here in season six of Deep Space Nine. Today, we're talking about the season premiere, A Time to Stand, and uh, things are getting a little exciting. Things are getting a little grim over here on Deep Space Nine. So, uh, but a lot has happened mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. week. Mike, quickly recap what has happened in your life. So we closed on our first home, Keith. Uh, I did some rough calculations. I've spent about a half a million dollars in rent uh, over the past 20 plus years. Uh, just money that, you know, is gone, but has has wrought me the life I live. And now we have a little town home in Pennsylvania. All the fun stuff. I've started to port my stuff. My, my wife is slow playing the move. Uh, mm -hmm, but I've already mm -hmm. got mover. I've got the painters in there. I, current as we speak, that the new studio is being painted. Uh, there, there, Stanley Steamer is coming to clean the fresh carpet down. Not fresh, the old carpet down there. And then I'm going to start building my desk and getting move stuff moved into m next week. I'm going to be hopefully shooting by season by episode three. I'm hopefully going to be shooting I in the new studio. I can't wait. Now, yeah. if you are uh, if you are old time. K and M viewers, you could actually watch my process of that here in this basement mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because back uh, on the Out of Practice podcast, we are you know our, we did we did a similar thing, and you can see me like the couple of days after I moved in and this completely empty room back here, and then slowly have built my way up into the studio. I feel like Mike's gonna go faster than I did, but uh, uh yeah, well there will be incarnations because we probably won't move a lot of our. It's also going to be the theater room down there, so there's going to be two sides. So I have to really mm -hmm. determine the proper layout. I've done some 3D modeling, Keith. <laughs> no surprise. Yeah, and uh, I've I've got two versions, and so I'm going to try some stuff out. But you know, the important thing is that the all of my internet gear is set up over there, mm -hmm. and my server mm -hmm. is running from over there, and yeah, uh, uh, yeah. you know. The, I, I, well, the thing is. I do know because I also 3D modeled this basement <laughs> and it is also the theater room as well as the studio. It's all of those things because uh, Mike and I are basically the same person. Just one of us is much more attractive than the other one. I'm going to leave that to you, viewer, to decide which is which. Uh, all right, but there is more mm. important mm -hmm. Mike stuff that we have to do. The best today. weeks are Mike weeks, I have to say. <laughs> Shocker. Let's get some light uh, on folks, the scene here. Uh, we have gotten a lot of votes from uh, you, the viewers here of Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. But uh, since I'm the decider, we have a very important ceremony mm -hmm. to do because Mike has now, uh, I, I should have done the math, but I haven't, uh, gone from a, a complete Star Trek noob, knowing nothing about Star Trek, and has now reviewed five full seasons of Deep Space Nine, I believe well over a hundred episodes now, mm -hmm. uh, and God, I don't know what, 150 episodes of Star Trek toys now? Yeah, and of course, Strange New Worlds and some of the That's stuff. right. Lots of stuff. So, uh, Mike has now spent hundreds of hours speaking about Star Trek Online, and I think it might be time to move past Noob. And you know, we're not gonna do that. With uh, without any fanfare, we can't just announce it. So uh, let's go into our screening room. I believe we have a, a ceremony ready to go. Are you ready, Mike? I uh, am probably not ready, but we're gonna try anyway. <laughs> Here we go. Many years ago, just outside of Philadelphia, a boy was born. An odd child who set his heart to the pursuit of musical theater. <laughs> He took his guitar and chased that dream across the country. He died on the Titanic. He watched his weight to music. He sailed the seven seas as a dollar store Jersey boy. 
But something was missing. A spark of joy. That piece of his soul that would make him complete. That spark was Star Trek. He began as the newbiest of noobs, not knowing a self-sealing stem mold from a jar of yam exhaust. But over the years, he learned, he studied, he gave many confidently uninformed opinions. Until one day, he woke up and was no longer nubile. Almost against his will, Star Trek had infiltrated his heart, and that spark of joy was finally there. And Noob Mike looked down to see a pip shining in the light of a star. He was no longer Noob Mike. He was indeed Ensign Mike. <laughs> oh, man. I, I know how obsessive you probably were about that, not only the stalking, but the creation of it, and uh, I couldn't appreciate it anymore. Oh, uh, wow. I'm uh, I'm proud. I'm proud of it. I, I mean... I haven't even looked at our screening room yet, so I imagine... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You can have your AI... You can have your technology, you can have your VR. Mm -hmm. All I want is the instantly updating OBS because of Dropbox surprise Remotely, magic. yeah. Remotely, yes, Ooh. I updated our entire setup completely remotely. Yeah. Mike didn't have to touch a button. Nope. Uh, all right, so how does it feel? You are now an ensign. You know, Keith, it, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna say right now, I, I wish I had a, a funny quip, but I don't. I'm gonna have to get real with the folks out there. <laughs> Like the rest of my life, my imposter syndrome won't allow... All I can think is like, oh, man, people are going to think you should know more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even enjoy it, G, damn it. Just anxiety. Anxiety. Uh -huh. That's You know what? One pip. One pip. One pip. It's just one. You're just an ensign. My favorite vote was someone who voted in and said, he's just he just gets to be a red shirt that doesn't die. <laughs> A survivor. Yeah. You just need to survive the like, episode. That, that actually fits pretty good, too. Anyway, I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm just hoping to make it to the next season, to get renewed. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't cancel us. We're not paid. That's fair. So, uh, so, so there you go. Well, all right. So now it is time to talk about what you, the viewer, now you all weighed in on Mike's promotion. Mm -hmm. Well-earned promotion. And now it is time to uh, get your opinions on last week's episode season called finale. Two Arms, the season finale of season five. Nope, that's not it. That's not the right one. How about, let me get back to here. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Let's try this again. Oh, yeah, that's still, I, I must not have updated a thing. Anyway, uh, here we go. Hail, I'll, I'll fix that later. Yeah, it works. Hails from the patrons. So here is what you had to say. Joshua Cronin says, such an amazing episode. You both said that a lot during this, and I agree with 100%. Agree with that 100%. So, not much else for me to say. The table setting this does for the rest of the series is great. 95 self-sealing stem bolts from me. Brian from Video Game Drive-By says, watching y'all as I assemble one of my many unbuilt Gundam model kits that I've bought over the past 10 years. I call it from the, I call it the pile of shame. No shame here. I love this episode so much, uh, table setting for the fantastic upcoming seasons. And despite everyone being separated by the events of this episode, it feels like this entire episode is tying a bow on how much closer everyone truly is. This isn't a station, it's a community. And just like all of great Star Trek, even in the dark, there is hope. 95 self-sealing, self, 95 station sabotaging stem bolts. Amazing. As for the wormhole, I wonder if the, he had to smuggle the Yamak sauce due to the borders of the Cardassian Union being closed once they joined the Dominion. That's a good point. It's basically Cuban cigars or Romulan ale. I love how much Rom has grown. He's the absolute perfect version of real smart, not too bright sort of character I love to see. Yeah. He's the unsung hero of the series, in my opinion. Him and Lita deserve each other. And bonus points for Jeffrey Combs' delivery of Wayun's You Do Not Allow. And that is the my moment of realization that he actually had a, was a genuine threat. Chef's kiss. We would like to welcome new patron Kalana Dakmar. 
uh, who we've read a couple of really interesting comments from before, but now, as a patron, welcome to the team. Uh, they say, epic start. I got, peop I got people usually into period fantasy from Lord of the Rings to Game of Thrones to at least watch Deep Space Nine using my reduced to core episode season like an HBO series of six to 10 episodes. For Deep Space Nine, I cut two only. Uh, I cut to only thirteen episodes. By this season, they were hooked. Then disappointed with the rest of Trek, <laughs> DS9, and Bear. Writers and actors and crew were the main reason. Harry Pothead says this is a great season finale. I always felt like the point of a season finale was to try to guarantee people were going to tune in next year to see how it resolves. And in the end, yeah. Uh, of this, there's no way I wasn't going to go and see the next episode. 100 stem bolts from me. Kevin Miles says, I give this episode 98 self-sealing stem bolts. Who would have thought that a baseball could take the wind out of Ducat's sails? Bravo, Cisco. Very well put. Hibernation Pod says, I'm wondering if they shot a lot more scenes than cut it to a super tight near perfection. Like Keith said, this is the one I've been waiting for, despite many great episodes you've already covered so much world building within and leading up to it in the many years of progression truly one of the best season finales ever of any show i have ever seen in my opinion i've also thought of rom as the mvp i never blamed him for starting the war but i suppose he played a notable role triggering it along with starfleet to me i always thought of his character development to be one of the better of the series it reminds me of when odo once said rom's an idiot he couldn't fix a straw if it were bent now here we are, watching him, watching him come up with an idea for an impenetrable defense that gives the Federation and its allies a fighting chance to save the Alpha Quadrant. I love Kira's look when Dukat comes on board. Nothing less than pure hatred for him. When the good guys lose, or at least not win, I find that raises the stakes and leaves us with a feeling of how real the crisis is getting. Mike, yeah, and it's, it's a little bit like, uh, like, like wrestling. You don't always want to send your fans home happy. Sometimes the heels need to win to have stakes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, my personal favorite, 99.99 self-sealing stem bolts, just to be higher than Keith, but not giving it a rating of absolute perfection because that never feels right to me, even when this episode is freaking great. The mysterious Anne comes in, says, Coming off a stretch of lots of work travel, the dulcet tones of K&M have been a source of joy in a tiring time. Aw, thank you guys, patrons and commenters, too. I like that you pointed out all the two-person vignettes for this one. It reminds me of how, when I finished joining a Star Trek Facebook, Facebook groups, there would be lots of favorite character polls for Next Generation and other Star Trek series, but for Deep Space Nine... The fans usually gravitate towards naming the favorite relationships rather than favorite individuals. Mm -hmm. While the individual characters end up with pretty amazing arcs, it's often hard to separate their growth and change from their relationships. The best part of Deep Space Nine is the interplay between the characters over time. 98 self-sealing stem bolts from me. It's a very good point, Anne. Uh, and I completely agree. YouTube viewer says it was a dick move for them to throw out the Yomic sauce. Agreed. It's not illegal to have Cardassian condiments. In happier times, the Federation for served yamak sauce to visiting Cardassians. I guess makes made a good point that tensions are high. That's fair. In order for self-replicating mines to make new mines, they would need to have more mass than they lose when blowing up, so they'd have to cannibalize ships they destroy. But if they were blown up independently, they wouldn't be able to replicate themselves. Interesting concept, but that makes sense. This probably didn't factor into the writing for why not send five ships, but Starfleet was in, has a lot of variation in their ships. The Defiant is their best warship, but they still use hundred-year-old ships in their fleet. Because Starfleet doesn't like to sacrifice ships and crews, an outdated warship is as much a liability as an asset when you have to defend your weak link and very explodable buddy ship. A very good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Dominion, on the other hand, doesn't mind sacrificing ships or people. The Jem'Hadar bred in vats, and they don't really value Cardassians' lives either. Draw whatever parallels you want to current or historical wars. Churchill never met the German mustache man, but he did meet with Stalin, who also had a larger mustache. Speaking of mustache men, Ziel is Dukat's daughter. She's not just half Cardassian, she's half Dukat. 
That's basically Bajor's personal mustache man. They only touch on it a little bit. It's a very good point. That said, I'm glad Rom got to save the world and got the girl. Now, of course, this is this is some uh, some this is some uh, neurodivergent stuff here. I like it. Dukat doesn't have intergalactic importance. He has importance over one galaxy. Technically, half of one galaxy, though I'm not sure if the Beta Quadrant ever gets involved. Three quarters of a galaxy at most. It is a bold move. <laughs> All right. I duly corrected. It is a bold move that they leave Deep Space Nine on a show called Deep Space Nine. Yeah. And they, they, they stay left, at least as of this episode. That's why I like this show. They sometimes bend or break the series continuity in order to tell a good, tell a few stories. Though I suppose because the cast is split, we still get to see Deep Space Nine set under occupation. This is a near perfect episode. I give it 99 out of 100 self-replicating cloaked minds. And uh, lastly, you are right. They set up a lot of great ingredients to cook with and based on my reading of season six, none of the ingredients are wasted. I also eat my Skittles like an OCD person, but I consider grape, I consider grape a mid-level Skittle. Ugh, for shame. I usually go yellow, green, unless it's apple, apple goes in the garbage, agreed. Purple, what? red, orange. I, I like I, I think we I think we agree on sort of like the the half that are good and the half that are basically garbage. Uh but for me yeah, because I go green, yellow, or yellow green, then Listen. orange. Orange is orange is, is where we cross over to the good Skittles and we get to the red and the purple. Alright, whatever. No. Oh, there's only one correct way. Listen, you just, I just cannot, you just have no street cred because you like candy corn. It just, you just lose it all right there. It's, you're absolutely, you lo you have no candy cred, bud, man. I'm sorry. Get the hell, get the, you mean this ab delicious? Absolute, mm. absolute trash. Oh, it's so maybe I'll, maybe I'll eat some during the episode. Absolute oh, look at trash. that sweet, sweet candy corn. Sorry, mm. sorry, sorry to, uh, to, uh, neuro, neuro divert the episode, but I need it. <laughs> I need you in the comments. Team, team candy corn, team candy corn is trash. Let us know. If you say nothing about 601, I want to know about the candy corn. <laughs> yep. That sounds great. Yeah. That, that, that's, uh, that's par for the course. Oh, All you, right. Are so, there more? Are there more? No, there's more. Of course okay. there's this it's is, a season for season yeah, premiere, you're right, buddy. You're right, you're right. So JD says I did watch last week, but I was working and got too busy to comment. I am voting on Mike for Lieutenant Junior Grade after he watches Star Trek Three. Oh, Worf was still a JG for season two. The weird part was Jordy was a full lieutenant only for season two, then got a promotion again in season three. Speed two going fast on a boat. Such stakes, much thrills. The dog ate my homework, then the neighbor ate the dog, so I have a concept <laughs> of an idea of the homework. Well done. Well done. <laughs> the effect shots in this episode still hold up so damn well. I was Mike's thinking about that this a... week. I was thinking about that. Yeah. Mike's ready for a pip and a pop. Part of me has this vision that Jake becomes the Hunter S. Thompson of the 24th century, doing loads of drugs and traveling the galaxy and writing amazing stories. That's funny. I disagree on the act thing. Way of the Warrior was the Act 2 opener. This is the Act 2 finale with Season 6 and 7 as the final third act. Yeah, you know what? That's a, I think that's a really good point. You're thinking in screenwriting acts. Because I'm a theater person, I'm always thinking in terms of stage acts, where there's usually only two. Mm. Uh, certainly for a musical. Yeah, so, I mean, unless uh, we're talking like Othello. Like a play. I mean, August Osage has three acts. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I have a theory that shortly before these events, Garrick started the, let's call it, rel oh, no, nope, not going to read that, because that is a spoiler. Mike calls Rom being a spy the ultimate ascension, I giggle knowingly. My, fav my absolute favorite moment is Ducat finding the baseball because Ducat knows, well, knows as well as the audience how much Ben loves the ball and would promise uh, that it comes with it being a thing he left behind. You know, things we leave behind is important to the episode. Uh, I, or to the series. I agree that it is a damn near perfect episode. I would go 98 self-sealing stem bolts. You know when they say, you know they say the, the Acropolis, where the Parthenon is. There are no straight lines. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And lastly, we got a super tip and a thanks from Maynard Stuff, who just says, thanks for what you do, and we, we thank you for supporting 
our little nonsense and uh, enjoying the stuff that we do. That's why we do it. It's way fun that way. All right. You let know, us. Oh, go ahead. I'll say two things. So to that point, I went and saw uh, in a sophisticated evening with Larry David last night. Oh. He basically, I thought it was going to be stand up, but it actually was just a, like a sit down Q&A interview type thing. Anyway, not the point. The point is, is that what he basically said, his best point was like, I feel like I stole money for all these years because I just had the time of my life. He's like, I'm, I'm glad yeah. everybody loved it, but we're ju I'm just had, I just had a blast. And I feel very similarly. I just have so much fun doing the show and watching the show. In fact, what people, patrons who watch our watch along of Deep Space Nine, when have noticed this week, it wasn't a normal studio setup. Jen and I were just stressed out from closing, so we just like sat on the couch and watched Deep Space Nine. So it's not the best technical episode. Uh, honestly, I watched it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best version. Yeah, it was just like very casual and chill. And, and, and like hearing you and Jen talk about it, like, yeah. and like th there weren't other things happening. Like I thought that was a great way to do it. You should do always do it that way. And you get to see it on the big screen. So that you get to appreciate was it. that was really cool. I have to say. I, so, I think you should do it that way. Yeah, I have thoughts now. in the in the new studio of how we might be able to do that. So, um, without like, awesome. yeah. Anyway, so that was point one, and then point B. Uh, because of you know, having now seen how many episodes, how many uh, seasons some of the other series had, it stands to reason that they were pretty clear that they were wrapping things up at this point. That had another season or two. Yes. And so, unlike another show we watched, where they sort of piloted a new series in their final mm -hmm. couple episodes of season six. The final first full season. Yeah. This feels very similar in that they were setting us up for a new show, but that new show is actually just the final its own story, show. right? It's yeah. like, we're seasons one through five, we're setting up the actual Deep Space Nine story, which is season six and seven, is what it feels like. I don't know, but that's what it's felt like. Well, I mean, we're and we're obviously transitioning into a much more serialized version of the show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's gonna you know, it's not gonna be entirely serialized all the way through the next two seasons, but they're gonna be long stretches that are basically just one long movie. Mm -hmm. And uh it's super, super fun. Okay, I think it is time to talk about the episode here. Deep Space Nine, season six, episode one, a time to stand. We took the whole summer off. We are now deep into September of 1997, September 29th. Uh, this is a junior year of high school for me. Uh, it's, it was good, junior year was good. Mm -hmm. The top song, you know, this is gonna be fun because we're gonna start hitting the same top songs from the practice. Oh yeah, I'm ready for that. But, but we can't play them like we did on the practice. So we're gonna have to hear it. Luckily, I think we're safe. Give us some sweet, sweet honey from Mariah Carey. Wait, the song is called Sweet, Sweet Honey? No, it's called Honey. I don't, I don't do a lot of Mariah. You're gonna have to make it up. Honey, could you get me some Skittles? But make sure you take the trash ones out and throw them in the trash with the candy corn. Great, great. Oh wow, that was such a good. We might get it. We might somebody. get a copyright strike on that. <laughs> uh, somebody make that their ringtone. Mm -hmm. All right, the top movie was The Peacemaker, the uh, George Clooney, Nicole Kidman movie, hmm. which I believe that I saw, but I just, it has lost. It's 97, right? So if I'm not mistaken, that movie is short lived in number one because shouldn't Titanic rule, be the one to rule them all for the next like months and months and months? Titanic was. Uh, I think it, it is going to take over for a while. Yeah. But, be, uh, but before you December. look that up, yeah. Mike. What was on TV tonight? Oh, Keith, it's it's the fall, so there's stuff. Uh, Just good stuff. There's good stuff, and there's some interesting pulls here. I'll, I'll I'll be I'll be brief, but ABC was trying a new show called Time Cop, based on the I think book or movie. Movie, yeah. the yeah. movie, the John Claude Van Damme classic. Yeah, Time well, Cop. Uh, they gave it a six episode trial here, and then they shut <laughs> her down, and they tried again with another six episode order the following year. And that was trash too, so uh, it doesn't last long. Uh, Monday Night Football, your 
San Francisco 49ers defeated the then Carolina Panthers 34 to 21. Was that the Panthers' first season? Thereabouts. I, I didn't look. I didn't yeah. look it up too much. Uh, Everybody loves Raymond. Is in its second season. Is firing on all cylinders. Sybil's on. And here's here's one. Here's a show I had did could did not remember. Uh, it ran just this one season. It was called George and Leo. Do you recall? No. George and Leo on CBS. Star vehicle. Check out this cast though. Ready? Okay. Bob Newhart. Ooh. Judd Hirsch. Okay. Jason Bateman. Wow. Some other folks I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it, it ran one season. It got a full order, 22 eps. Uh, I know nothing about it, but there you go. Nope. Well, Nowhere to, could not you... find it. I'm sure maybe it's on the depths of YouTube, but so that that's cool. Um, and then Keith, uh, mm. our, our, our boy, our boy, mm-hmm. Allie McBeal is airing its third episode ever. Wow. So Ally McBeal had just started. Man, so you're getting Deep Space Nine season six. You've got this new show, Ally McBeal, which is like an all-timer. Season uh, two of The Practice. Season two of The Practice is airing. Oh, it's uh, it doesn't get any better. And we're and we're like soon the West Wing oh, Buffy, is coming. Right, we're in Sopranos season, is we're coming. In, Buffy is first happening. First season, second season of Buffy. Uh, and of course, NBC starts airing. Dateline NBC. We've got a fair hearing. The Untouchables. Who killed Jean Bonnet? We've got the Jean Bonnet Ugh. mystery taking over the world. So if you were a TV person, mm. your cup runneth over in I 1997. Mean, truly, truly, yeah. Okay. So uh, one more piece of TV stuff. What was Voyager doing? They were doing the episode Nemesis, where Chakotay is on the war planet. Uh, now. Interestingly, with Star Trek at this point, they offset the series a little bit Mm. so that, um, and I think it was really smart because that way you could try to have a new thing on every week of Trek. So Voyager's already been on the air for like four episodes by now. So that uh, Voyager will start and end a little earlier than Deep Space Nine and shifted and uh, so you don't have a night where they're like both reruns. So smart. All right, so A Time to Stand was directed by Alan Croker, who also directed Call to Arms. So directed both halves of this little movie here. It has a teleplay by showrunner Ira Steven Bear and Hans Beimler, who last wrote it on, wrote it, mm, wrote on M. Season six, baby. North. Season six, we're not getting any better. We're louder, but we're not better. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time for something trivial. Now, Keith, waste your time with Trivial Trivia. Okay. So, uh, I thought this was interesting from a production standpoint. When Cisco slams his hand on the desk in anger, his breaking of the glass was unintentional. Nice. But they kept it since it underscored Cisco's frustration. Uh, I totally get it. I'm always the guy who broke stuff. When I got too excited acting, mm. I was doing uh, I was doing Miz, and I was I was covering Javert, so we did the 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 put in, and he had like this stick, right? And I just I was like so in. We were doing the confrontation. I was so in it, and I just hit the the ground with it, and it sh- it was like old, and it shattered in my hand, and so I finished the confrontation with like blood streaming out of my hand. Okay. Yeah, for a fucking rehearse, rehearsal that I never went on for. Whatever. <laughs> I know a little something about that. I was ready. I was ready, though. So the episode is dedicated to the memory memory of Brandon Tartikoff, the former chairman of Paramount Pictures, who died in 1997. It was Tartikoff who originally approached Rick Berman about doing a new Star Trek series, and it was Tartikoff's idea to do a stationary show as opposed to one on a starship. So very important for Deep Space Nine lore. The opening shot of A Time to Stand featuring the retreating flotilla of Starfleet vessels was one of the last mass scenes entirely composed of footage from physical studio models, save for the CGI Defiant. To beef out the scene, the production staff built several new ships, kitbashing them out of parts from commercially available AMT Ertl and the Revel Monogram Star Trek model kits. Uh, which I always find like so fascinating that you you do a sci-fi property, they build mm-hmm. a model of it, 
then you use that toy based on your idea to create new things for the show. They may then make a model from from their own model. The snake eating its own tail, but it's really interesting. Or a Boros? Sure. Uh, so, Admiral Ross's uniform. Is someone that singing? At your, is that on your side? Yeah, no, Jill. She's, okay. she's 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 going in for a show, so she's uh, she's working through it. Uh, I'll tell you off air. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Admiral Ross's uniform still matches the older Next Generation style with the colored body and black shoulders, rather than the newer black and gray style that the rest of the cast wears. A new Admiral's uniform had not been designed or budgeted for in an already very expensive episode. Uh, apparently, Starfleet uniforms cost the studio roughly three to four thousand dollars a piece. Yikes. Uh, so yeah, so we get old school Admiral, but uh, don't worry. We're gonna get it eventually when they have some budget, when they're not blowing up the universe on camera. You wanna know who blows up our hearts? And uh, <laughs> Maybe, our hearts and our wallets, Mike. Wow, that might have been your best, your best ever. Um, that's the patrons, Keith. Sure and is. And guys, I don't know if you know, but I know the font is getting smaller, which means there are more of you, and it is just an honor and a privilege to uh, for this have to have worked. Uh, thank you so much for caring enough about the show and about what we're doing here to help us do it. And uh, here are those folks. I will say them. This one time, seriously. <laughs> Brian, sure. Kimball Beersock, Peter Bank, Frank Rinch, Quark's Bar, Yanba, Ryan Chesley, Andre, Romulan, Shoulder Pad Enjoyer, welcome, welcome to, the, to team. the team. Joshua Cronin, Merritt Neath, Andrew Hayes, Alan, and the mysterious in that mysterious household, Worf's b -b 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 big old boot shivs, Charles Babbage, Harry Pothead, Anton Thies, Carl Fisher, Brian from Video Game Drive By. CRM Productions, Nikolai Ivanovich Lobachevsky, YouTube Viewer, James Hubbard, Hibernation Pod, Miri Holcomb, Odo's Bucket, Lost Emu, Scott B, JD Makes, Colin Dagan, Chris Mitchell, he's CRM, Frank Rinch, Pat, Joshua Cronin, Kevin Miles, Bullion for Soup, Lutz Kremer, Wyatt Eldridge, Andreas Erickson, Jerome A. Gibson, and Zontar One. Welcome, Welcome to the team. Of course, Chancellor Jen, she's in our hearts and she is running the whole thing. Listen, you might notice a couple people's names listed twice. That's because you can send us stuff in the mail to you review sure on our other show. Check out you know, that show to get our address. You can also just email us at... Uh, look at my Star Trek Look toys at my Star Trek toys at gmail.com. Or, of course, Keith and Mike Entertainment, all one word, at gmail.com. Check it no, out. No, don't do that one. I don't check that one. I, I, want the I do. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> we also have a Hall of Fame. Uh, we sure Oh, that's that's <laughs> something else, but we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for funding this nonsense. Uh, Casey Clark, Brian Kaufman, Jason Moe, Joshua Cronin, The Mysterious Anne, Andrew Hayes, Worf, Spoot Shivs, Colin Dagan, Quarks Bar, Pierre Bank, Jessica, Jennifer Massanova, Cloud Number 69, Jorge Navoa, Charles Babbage, Brian Kimball, Beersock, Frank Rinch, JD, Kevin Miles, CRM Productions, Ryan Chesley, they have donated over a hundred dollars. Uh unbelievable. Listen, Unbelievably. The other thing I'll say, everybody, is that Did you see my shoulder pads? Well done, buddy. Well, really, yeah. really well done. Uh I I wanna put this back up and Both let you know wallet. that you see we we but the pips denote how much people are, are making, but you should know that all of the content is not financially gate kept. So at even the one dollar right. level, you can get all the goodies, and yet people still choose to be on those other tiers, uh, which is astounding. Astounding and appreciated, and exactly what we hoped would happen. Because uh, you know, at any time, change, do what you have to do. We don't, and and I, I do want to say pop, also, pop in, hop off. if you go to the Patreon page, and you just become a member, you're not giving any money, you're just checking it out. I've made the audio versions of my watch along open hmm. to all members of the channel for a dollar you can watch it but yeah. if you're just still on the fence i want you to know that you don't have to give any money you can still get the audio version i can't show you the video because you know we're skirting the surface of stuff but anyway we appreciate you all thanks for being part of the team really really excited about these next two seasons okay well i think it is time to hop into that screening room Ba -ba 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 -ba. Ba -ba -ba. 
ba 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 Sing it, Mike. Ba ba ba. Oh, just. Oh. Just as pitchy so in season six. Just gets better and better. I mean, really, <laughs> we are, are we are all so grateful. Uh, look, look, you've, you've got your pip right there. Yeah, man. You like your pip, Keith? It's almost like a golden fan. Ooh, <laughs> yes. For uh, those of you who <laughs> watch the End of Practice podcast first, then you can really understand our our uh, old inside jokes. Oh, double fan! Hey, and look, so many fans. Fan. Oh man, so many inside jokes. It's so deep. Oh, the deepest of cuts. Not even people who listen to the show quite understand it. <laughs> I'm not sure we do. <laughs> All right. A time to stand. We have a long recap, which uh, gets us back to where we are. So in Act 1, we begin. Mike, two months have passed. And the battle has been happening. Cisco and the Defiant are limping home with the wreckage of what used to be their fleet. Most of the ships are on fire, which of course makes no sense in the vacuum of space, but whatever, it looks super cool. Uh, but they are coming back from uh, getting their ass royally kicked. And oh, oh three months, not two months, three mm -hmm. months. O'Brien says three months of bloody slaughter and what do we have to show for it? Not a damn thing. Engage and retreat, engage and retreat. Just one time I would have liked to have seen their backs. We are also reminded we have not heard from the 7th Fleet, so things are really not going well. It's so, so cool, and the exact right choice to start at Mandia Res, right? Just yeah. in progress, getting exposition as they kind of do a, as a status report, it, it, great. It's not overloaded. It, perfect. And, and I love that we're starting this with getting our ass kicked mm -hmm. and and that uh you know i think we continue to ratchet up the stakes of like what this means but also learning that we are the underdogs here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and we are we are not ready for this the the uh, dominion is incredibly strong and it's really bloody like a lot of people have died and you know again this isn't what traditional Star Trek has been up to this point. And we're seeing a lot of, you know, hearing a lot of it off screen, but like, oh, we're talking thousands and thousands of people have died already. And my understanding, because of the way it seems that the Dominion does their treaties and such, is that all of the fighting is taking place between Federation starships and Federation fighters and Jem'Hadar Hadar exclusively? And Cardassian. Yes. Yeah, oh, right, because they're... they're they, they'd love to send the Cardassians out in the front line. They don't give a crap. Right, okay. So we are warring with Cardassia as well. But at, but at this point, it's the Federation and the Klingons versus the Jem'Hadar and the Cardassians. And uh, Bajor but, uh, is kind of out of it, but... Ba Bajor has the non-aggression. So they, right. they are technically allies of sorts with the Dominion at this point, or at what least... What about Ferenginar? Do we know what their actual status is? Uh, I believe Ferenginar is like... Good luck with that. We'll be here to pick up the pieces. Anybody want to buy some right? guns? They're probably pay-per-view, yeah, and guns. <laughs> pay-per-view! Uh, well, they're, they're helping people gamble on the outcome. Mm -hmm. That is that is what's happening. Um, so, uh, we go to the infirmary, and an exhausted Bashir treats Garrick, who was injured during the attack. And we can tell they are both pretty stressed out by the state of the war. Bashir has used his genetically enhanced brain... And uh, to calculate a 32.7 chance, uh, percent chance w of winning the war against the Dominion. Now, Garrick says, look at you. You act like you haven't a care in the world. It's that kind of smug superior attitude that makes people like you so unpopular, meaning genetically enhanced. Don't take it so personally. It's strictly a matter of mathematics. It's strictly a matter of our lives. You, we're, you're not genetically engineered. You're a Vulcan. Bashir says, if I'm a Vulcan, how do you explain my boyish smile? Not so boyish anymore, Doctor. And that is very much true. That Bashir has, has grown a great deal. Uh, it actually, there seems, that for me, there's a lot of subtext here, too, about the different relationship they have developed over the years and how it was a little flirty in the beginning. And I think that, I think part of that attraction for Garrick, be it romantic or not, that's not even important to it, but part of that attraction was 
a little playing with your food, right? Yeah. He was smarter than him. He could he could best him. And now that is put into question. Not only <clears throat> is he probably have a superior, not most likely has a superior intellect, but he didn't catch it, right? So he, he actually kind of put one over on him. His hiding it all yeah. those years, he actually was able to pull that over on Garrick. So I think his his being a little salty here is earned. That actually makes a great deal of sense. And, you know, in my life, I've noticed that certain relationships are based on a little bit of the power dynamic. Mm -hmm. Not and certain, when that most power relationships. dynamic changes, not every relationship can withstand that. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. And and I th I think you're right. Like Garrick has always had the upper hand, and it's totally different now. And I think the the better relationships based on real friendship as opposed to ego stroking can withstand that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I've I've had times I've I've lost friends because when we met, you know, they might have been above and I was below, and it switched or the you know vice versa, and the friendship didn't survive. Um, I'm, I, I think their friendship will survive, but clearly the transition is a little little rocky. Mm. So we go to the mess, and Dax and Sisko are greeted by Martok and Worf, who have beamed over from Martok's ship. Dax leaps into Worf's arms. Martok complains that all Worf has been doing during this war is stressing out about the wedding. Worf is being Groomzilla, but he and Dax still run off to rattle the bulkheads in a more, the more fun way. Uh, were you a Groomzilla? No, I, I, this, when I tell this story, it seems like I was hands off and I wasn't. I was, I had some, I had thoughts. I let them be known. My big things were I didn't want to invite people we didn't know. I wanted to keep it like pretty close friends and family and people that would be good at a party. I knew the kind of vibe <laughs> I was looking for. And outside of that, like the minutia, I knew Jen was really enthused about it. So I played Grand Theft Auto V. <laughs> I was always present. And I said, mm -hmm. just ask me binary questions. You know, <sighs> like this or this. Mm -hmm. Do you want this or that? Do you want to have the said person open? And I will give you yes or no's and my opinions. And it worked, man. <laughs> so I was not Groomzilla. I was, I mean, not gonna lie. I think I beat up some prostitutes in the <laughs> in the video game and uh, drove aggressively. But uh, outside of that, it was pretty pretty chill. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. I I I had like one moment the day before because it was gonna rain and it was outdoors, and I got I I, I thought I could control the weather with mind bullets. I could mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, Martok is here to get an injury treated by Bashir since Klingon doctors suck. No surprise. Bashir comes in and says they've been ordered to a starbase for reassignment. And he has news on the 7th Fleet. Only 14 ships made it back to our lines. 14 out of 112. Yikes. Uh, and when you really like break that down, it's like 14 Enterprises. Now, Enterprises is a galaxy. It's, it's giant, but like these whole ecosystems, these whole life, and they're all, or, or 98 <laughs> have been completely obliterated. Yikes. Hey, as important as all of that is, mm -hmm. what's awesome about storytelling when it's done well, we got all the exposition we've needed from various sources, which is excellent, but at the end of the day, this is all you need, is this shot. Yeah. That Now you know exactly where we are, how things are going. Yeah, that hundred uh, percent. Like, there's all all of that is in Avery's face right there. He's he's very very good, uh, and he's uh, he, he's not happy, mm -hmm. and he smashes the glass table with his fist. So in Act Two or Act One, Ducat strides through the occupied Deep Space Nine, triumphantly doing his version of a captain's log. The war continues to go well. Each day brings reports of new victories. It's only a matter of time be before the Federation collapses and Earth becomes another conquered planet under Dominion rule. All in all, it's a good time for Cardassia and the Dominion. He walks into a meeting with Wayun Damar and Kira. 
Wayun is delighted to find out that the Bajorans are returning to the station. This makes Damar and Dukat nervous, of course, and Kira uses this opportunity to try to get her Bajoran security forces back in place. Dukat shuts it down, and Wayun chooses not to overrule at this point. But he does pull Kira aside to ask about Odo, reminding us that Wayun considers Odo a literal god. Kira leaves, and Wayun sternly kicks Damar out and puts Dukat in his place. In the future, it might be prudent to include me in all decisions relating to station policy. Now, what about the wormhole? You assured me that you could dismantle the minefield within a month. That was two months ago. I admit work is proceeding slowly, more slowly than expected, but these aren't ordinary mines. Every time we destroy or deactivate one of them, its neighbor replicates a new one. Self-replicating mines. I'd like to meet the Federation engineer who came up with that. Well, it wasn't a Federation engineer. The Ferengi. There's no need to panic. We're winning the war. For the moment, yes. But to defeat the Federation, we're going to need reinforcements and new supplies of Ketracel White. Soon. We yeah, it sorry, out. that's my that's my phone. <laughs> uh, which I I think that scene is such a great table <laughs> table setter because we're getting a whole bunch of exposition, but we're also helping develop relationship dynamics. Mm -hmm. In this, we we you know we learn from this. Dukat thinks he's in charge. Wayun actually is. Wayun is obsessed with Odo, so Odo is actually in charge. And Kira's at the bottom of the totem pole. It In most television, especially at this time, is very pro wrestling, right? It was like, good guy, bad guy, right? And we've right. talked about in Deep Space Nine how they ride the gray area very well. We've talked about that ad nauseum. But we're at a whole nother level now. Yeah. The Where Dukat is operating from, especially a little later, I'll save it for that conversation when he goes full, like... I'll talk about it later. Full monster. Oh, yeah. yeah. But like... Wayun right here. Yeah. The Vorta and the Wayun. I, I don't have a. F I, I'm not fully up to speed yet on how the, uh, the inner inner workings are happening. But my current read is freaking fascinating, man. It's it's a, in one level very simple, and in another le level very complicated. It's simple in that he is a a C3PO, right? He is a he is a hospitality droid. He is just making. Right. He is an emotional. Attaché. He is attempting right. to make sure all of the relationships are where they're he, supposed to a, be. He's a diplomat. Yeah, he's a diplomat. Great. Well, well said. But he, his masters, instead of being like is is instead of being like the king or the president, is a god to him. And so, right. which actually gives you a little more insight. Whereas, like a Dukat, who's operating very uh, selfishly for his own right. gain and for his personal ambition. You have to assume, just based on our, my sort of working understanding of like religion, that Wei Yun is operating in good faith to to mm -hmm. ascertain what his God wants, because clearly they are omnipotent, and so he's not going to, you know, or at, at the very least, has not shown any signs of personal ambition. Mm -hmm. And whereas, yes, the 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 founders are not have not been shown to be violence free they're obviously very can be very harsh they and started deadly. an intergalactic yes. war but at the same time we don't or know the, we don't whatever. know we are not privy to the inter machinations of their military strategy so we don't actually know the orders being the marching orders being handed down to Wei Yun outside of the very stark lines of okay right. us get Bajor on our side get get the minefield well, clear and we also at this point we don't know how much information Wayun is getting mm -hmm. because they can't put people through the wormhole. Did, I, did they disable communications? Are their founders on this side at all? And is we don't he know just guessing at what, what they want. What sort of power he has been handed, right? right. For all we know, at the press of a button, he could have Dukat taken care of, he could have right. all these people just eradicated. Maybe he's choosing not to, or maybe he hasn't been given that permission. It's, we, I don't know, and that's awesome. 
And it's and you know, and I think the answer is diplomatic pragmatism. And and like, you know, what we what we know about Wei Yun thus far, he's a diplomat and he's a pragmatist. Mm-hmm. And and he would rather get things done the easy way than the violent way, but he's perfectly capable of doing it. Um I mean it's fascinating. And this is why I think I'm not alone in loving the character of Wei Yun mm-hmm. on top of the I mean the performances. It actually we get a lot but. of clarity I once again I'll talk about it in a little bit. We get a lot of clarity in my opinion. Uh, I can't wait to bounce it off of you when we have the scene with Jake later because it seems kind mm. of like a sort of flip little trivial scene, but I actually think it has oh, some stuff to say. And oh my god, you think it's good? You think it's prescient these days? Yeah. So Ooh. yeah, I mean the, that's on Jake's side though, but uh, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but also we're restacking um, the importance of the wormhole being mined because we are reminded now not only. Do they not have reinforcements? But they need more Ketracel White, mm-hmm. which controls their entire uh, army. So that stacks. So so we we found out we're seven minutes into the episode. We found out their great power and their success and their kryptonite. All in the seven minutes and restacked all these things. It's it's such good writing. It's so tight. So uh, we continue, and we arrive in Quarks, and it's a weird vibe. The Cardassians are there drinking and gambling, but the Jem'Hadar just sit there doing nothing, and the Bajorans are cowering in the corners. Quark walks through trying to sell stuff to the Jem'Hadar unsuccessfully. We then pan to Odo and Kira, and they discuss Dukat's clear desire to return to the occupation condi- conditions and neither of them really know what to do with Wayun. Nobody does. They're feeling useless in the war because Bajor is being kept out of the fighting. And they're clearly relying on each other in this dark time, uh, which is also really, you know, all the couplets, right? Mm -hmm. Their relationship is so layered, so complex, and now they're going through this occupation again uh, with weird power dynamics. Don't call it an occupation, Keith. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so Quark arrives and actually gives them a drink on the house. And Quark has a really interesting point of view on this occupation, which I thought was such a great added layer to the depth of this whole situation. Kira says, you know, I never expected to say this, but as occupations go, this one's not so bad. Or Quark does. I suppose that's true if all you're worried about is your monthly balance sheet. But Quark says... I'm not just concerned about profit, Major. Look around. Do you see any ghetto fences dividing the promenade? Or existing Bajoran slave laborers sprawled on the ground after a grueling day in the ore processing center? Do you hear the cries of starving children? I don't. Now don't get me wrong, I miss the Federation too. All I'm saying is things could be a lot worse. Fascinating. Oda says, I hate to say it, but he's right. The Dominion seems determined to show it can be a friend to Bajor. And Kira says, if it's such a good friend, then how come there are no Bajoran security officers on the station? Just layers of depth. Layers of depth. And honestly, not to like zoom out too far, but one of the things that I really love about Deep Space Nine in general is this complex dynamic of all these complex people it's not just good guy bad guy it's a series of relationships and dynamics and these galactic stakes and diplomacy and it's just i could get lost thinking through all of the various viewpoints and objectives of this whole dynamic that's happening right here um and it's it's the world building that i think makes deep space nine so exciting because it's interesting Mm-hmm. I'd you know like I love spending time. How does it work under this? Like, let's talk about all the little minutia and all the little details here. Uh, so I love it. Well, and also it does that thing we talk about that I love is it just asks the question, right? It doesn't force feed you the answer. And here it's it's a great moral quandary. Pretty basic. Is is any occupation is any war better than the other? Just be you know like is is. I don't even want to give examples because I'm going to go down a rabbit hole, but, yeah. you know, just because... Th- th- 
people who are suffering here in the United States, even though maybe they have a little bit more privilege because it's not a third world country and they have running water, does that mean it's better than those who are struggling for those basics? Like, I don't know the answer. I'm just saying yeah. it's asking you to wrestle with that. And that it's is terribly complex. Yeah. And and that's what makes it great. And, you know, no shade. I love me some Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. I really enjoy Star Wars. But, like, it doesn't have this layers of complexity. No, and it does some things better, I think. Like, no doubt. It, as far as, like, story, t as uh, different types of storytelling, obviously. Like, great example. Dukat in this episode, I think, is very much being framed, portrayed, and shot like Darth Vader. Mm hmm. Very often. And that's clearly, they take, I'm sure a lot of that is taken from the ways that Darth Vader is so badass, like how to shoot and how to, how to, how to, you know. But Darth Vader was not nearly as complex a character. Well, right, because Darth Vader, well, while Vader has some vulnerability in his, like, remaining good side and his connection to people, mm -hmm. he doesn't have the vulnerability that Dukat has in his personality types. Like, like Dukat's ego, mm -hmm. his preening narcissism, and his, which goes beyond, I want to control the world. I want to dominate the world. It goes to, I want the world to admire me and like me. And well, that is a, it, such a such a more layered way to think about stuff. Yeah, because it's 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 juxtaposed with and and coupled with, I want this woman to like me. Absolutely. Is it because I actually like this woman, or just because I need her to like me because I need to have everything I want? I mean, it's probably all of the above. And how many Datelines have you watched where how how real that is and how dark and insidious that that sort of evil is? Oh, scary. Yeah. It, it, it's like the question, would you rather be loved or feared? And for Dukat, I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I don't think he I don't think he understands love without fear. And of course, Alimo, the way he... He's so good. Yeah. Oh, anyway, we got to keep going. Yeah. Uh, so we arrive at the Starbase and Cisco meets with Admiral Ross. First time we've met Ross, won't be the last time we see him. And he has some news. As of right now, you are no longer in command of the Defiant, and we see a new set here on the space station, which looks great. That's I think that's the original model um, that they've used lots of different times. But what a cool freaking model cool. that is! So Dax and Cisco discuss. Cisco has been relieved of command of the Defiant and will get new orders later in the day. Dax says, "Call your dad." He's nervous because of Jake rem uh, remaining on the station, and Cisco hasn't told him about it. So they zoom, and we see Joseph Cisco for the first time in a while, and he is pissed, and he wants to bring Jake home. He says, "Tell them you want to go get your son." And Ben says, "It's war time. It's not up to me. I go where I'm sent." Are things really as bad as the news surface claims? Maybe worse. Maybe worse. Yeah. You certainly know how to comfort a frightened old man. You didn't raise me to be a liar. I raised you to be a chef for all the good that did me. <laughs> you know, there's something I just don't understand. You're always telling me that space is big, that it's an endless frontier filled with infinite wonders. That's true. Well, if that's the case, you'd think there would be more than enough room to allow people to leave one another alone. It just doesn't work that way. It should, but it doesn't which is interesting meta commentary on deep space nine as it relates to other trek but also about the human condition because all of that's true so on the station we we see jake for the first time let me let me, goes, let me inter yeah. let, let, let me just yeah, yeah, put a point here i as much as i enjoyed that episode we had down on earth with him mm -hmm. i thought it was a little it felt there were some parts that were a little hokey, like his whole vibe is a little hokey, and the episode was a little heavy-handed in some ways. In, in, interesting and important, but a little heavy-handed. This little clip out of him and usage of him, no notes. Yeah, well, he's he sort of speaks for the for the rest of us, mm -hmm. for the non-military, because at this point. You know, the Federation is about ex exploration, but this is now a military operation. And 
it's it's interesting to have a civilian perspective on it. So, and also, uh, like, I'm, I, we, we, I guess we don't ever really hear. Well, I guess we get a little bit with Jake. Is you know, we have problems with our news media here, Keith. As what? far as uh, getting a the truth or b like a neutral view of anything. But or, you know what, I, I step on a mine there. Our problem is not neutrality. Our problem is so being afraid of not being called neutral that you don't tell the truth. Okay, whatever it may be. Not even the point <laughs> of my, I'm just saying that's hyper -fo focused in, right? Zoomed in on a really small area if you, when you look at the earth. When you zoom out, holy shit, right? Yeah. How are you getting anything? How are you gonna get any news? How is, how do you, how do you know what's going on in a quadrant, yeah. in a galaxy? And like, oh, God, God bless us when we get yeah, that Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. When and we to get to Mars that... and it's only Elon who's controlling the media coming out of Mars, how are we going to know what's happening, Keith? <laughs> we are not. <laughs> We're not. It's like, oh, I spoke to a Martian who just said Elon had great abs? What? <laughs> That's all they had to say? Yeah, he, has, he does have a great ab. Yeah, not anymore. Uh, all right, so on the station, Jake goes up to Wayun and asks to interview him for the Federation News Service, as we said. Wei Yun has read all of his previous writings and declares him fake news. All in, he says he's blocked all transmissions of his articles. Parallels to today are obvious. And Jake says, what about freedom of the press? Wei Yun, great take here. Please tell me you're not that naive. But I only stayed here because I so I could report the occupation. You see, there you go again. This isn't an occupation. This is a Cardassian station. I'm sure you're aware that there are no Dominion troops on Bajor. And why should there be? We have a treaty with them. They're our friends. Uh, again, that great CD diplomacy. And, you know, uh, the, the power defines the truth. That's how it's always been. That's human history. So we go back to Starbase 375, and Ross gives Cisco his new assignment. Our heroes are going undercover on a Jem'Hadar ship. Specifically, the Jem'Hadar ship they captured in the ship. Great pan off of a previous episode. And their mission is to destroy a Ketracel White facility deep Excuse me, in Dominion space. Which we spent multiple episodes defining how important that is. Yes, the bricks, the bricks, man! We have laid so many bricks, we can just cut right to the meaty center. <clears throat> Great. And Bashir reminds us, without the white to sustain them, the Jem'Hadar won't be able to function. Without the white, the Jem'Hadar will die. I won't shed any tears, not if it helps end this war. This may be the only way we can end this war, other than surrendering. Another cool brick, though. Yeah. You know the episode we were on, like, the prison planet and Worf was fighting for his life all the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As kind of, like, one-off as that story was with Worf, they, it did, they did enough in that episode and the episode where we were stranded on that planet with the, the Jem'Hadar who could survive right, without the right. white. And in those two episodes... We, we planted enough of a seed that there was some sort of code of honor within the Jem'Hadar, and they weren't mm -hmm. just like bloodthirsty Gorn, basically. Right. And so right here where she's like, I won't shed any tears, it's not like we're just crushing ants on the sidewalk with a magnifying glass. There is there is it's that... A, it's a little spiky to hear. Yeah, it's, it's a little... Uh, it raises some hairs because war is hell, and it shouldn't be just easy for us to kill the bad guys. It's not like Wolfenstein yeah. where you're just blowing Nazis away, right? right. There's consequence and and, and and weight. And constantly through this episode, couplet to couplet, there's where it's not just the bricks being laid, but you're feeling the weight of them. And that is yeah. just so cool. And you're seeing the effect that it's having on our heroes. And that's a perfect example, right? That's not a Dax line, mm -hmm. right? But it is under these circumstances where she's watching people she cares about die right and left and feels the weight of like she might get her entire civilization might get wiped out 
So they have, uh, so they're going to take this ship that they covered, but they first they have to learn how to fly it. But first we have to admire how friggin' great that shot is mm -hmm. with that model. And you know, this station is really interesting because they've used this model, I think as far back as the, the first movie. And it's always at a different scale. Uh, sometimes it's super, super giant and the Enterprise can fly in it. Now it's kind of small because the Jem'Hadar ship is small, but uh, it always looks I don't know if it's the AI upscale or what, but this episode and, and last episode, like the effects hold up. And also the because it was shot on film and such, it really has a filmic quality to it. The, ho yeah. the whole thing, the lighting, it's just really well shot. Yeah, yeah. No, it, the whole whole thing is great. And um, and because it's wartime, I think the, the dark lighting really adds, it makes it feel more cinematic as opposed to like next gen it's lights are so bright all the time but that's true of deep space nine or from season one yeah i know that there are some complaints i've heard people hate that there's no chairs but like just, yeah, yeah why whatever. couldn't the federation bolt some chairs in but you know. not designed for that mike you, you got to play the bongos you, you you don't sit and play the bongos yeah, you get a booster seat man oh yeah. so uh as I said, after a great looking shot of the ship docked in the station, our heroes have spent two weeks learning how to fly at the Jem'Hadar ship. They bicker about wanting chairs, food, infirmaries, and view screens, and there are none of any of them. Jem'Hadar ships are basically blind suicide guns. Cisco arrives and they head off, but Garrick is coming along with them to help navigate Cardassian territory. O'Brien tells him to pull up a chair. Funny. Cisco puts on his Google Glass and we disembark. Uh, really, I, I think they look great. The Cisco monocle is cool, yeah. And they yeah. don't just make it like a goofy little set piece. They're they, when they do the sort of like, oh, it may hurts my it hurts my brain and Garrick has to wear it. I thought that was a neat little wrinkle that just not particularly important in this episode, but it adds a sci-fi wrinkle. It gives it a real lived-in sort of strategic it's a, quality. It's a sci-fi wrinkle. It you know, and it, we've addressed this before, but we're also like you know, uh, reinforcing how the Dominion treats its soldiers. You don't even let them know what's happening or where they are. And like even that it's... little, like, sort of alpha alpha screen overlay yeah. effect is, like... Looks great. It's very 1997. Um, but it still act holds well, up surprisingly it's, it's well. It's 1997, but it's also today. Like, AR stuff looks exactly like that now. Yeah, you're right. Because right. it was sci-fi then, now it's real, but it still kind of looks the same. So, uh, back on Deep Space Nine, we get Oof. a very creepy scene between Dukat, now wearing a Lord Farquaad wig, <laughs> and Kira. The text is, he wants to be closer with her. The subtext is definitely bordering on sexual assault. Uh, this is a very dark scene. Sexual predation, right? It's... Yeah. Well, it's the and, and I'm so glad that she quotes it at the end. She... They could have very well done that thing where you're like, oh, it's going to be just under the surface, but it's not. I mean, there is no subtext, Keith. She clearly calls him on it at the end. It, it, well, it's it's perfectly clear what yeah. the threat, what what he is threatening, and it's it's kind of terrifying, except for the ridiculous hair he's the <laughs> Lord Fauntleroy hair he's wearing right there. It's it, but but what's great about the scene, and I think it's I'm gonna I'm chalking this up to Alimo almost exclusively evil great bad guy with the threat of it right however there's enough and 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 in nana's performance too there's enough belief in his performance that the delusion is real for him it's not that he's going to force this on her it's he really believes he can win it and that yeah. is even crazier right yeah. you can write that in the sub in the in the director's notes all you want but you have to be able to sell it and they both sell it and it makes this scene just so so multi-dimensional. Mm. Well, it, it's the scariest scene in the whole episode. Yeah. Uh, and it's really cool. And Kira says, you've betrayed everyone, including your own people. It says, Cardassia was on the edge of an abyss, Major. The war with the Klingons turned us into a third-rate power. My people had lost their way. I made them strong again, great again. At what price? You've sold Cardassia to the Dominion. A high price to be sure, but look at what we're getting in return. The Alpha Quadrant itself. We made a deal. We'll see about that. Yes, we will. 
I could make things very pleasant for you here, Kira. You could start by doing something about your breath. Damn. No. Yeah, but how patient. do you poke a narcissist, man? Yeah. I'm a patient man. Just tell I him his wait. hands are small. <laughs> it's parallels here are pretty clear. Wait for what? What do you think is going to happen here, Ducat? You think you're going to wear me down with your charming personality? That I'm going to be swept off my feet by that insincere smile? Are you really so deluded that you actually believe we're going to have some kind of infinite, intimate relationship? We already do. He then tries to stroke her face. It is gross to the extreme. Now, hold on. There's another thing here that I couldn't help. It was in my brain, my worm brain here. Is it confirmed or is it conjecture that they had a tenuous relationship, the actors? Uh, I think in the mo or in the documentary they talked about how it was sometimes a little little tense. Okay. Because that isn't just excellent acting. There is a little bit in the Nas when she's coming at him, it felt a little, you know, maybe I'm just being a little, like, salacious gossiper here. It felt a little, like, a little poking through. Well, it, I, I got the sense from those series of interviews that Alimo is a bit of a method actor mm. and took it very, very seriously and gave that astoundingly good performance. Mm. But if he's bringing a little bit of that into the room, I can understand like, whoa, dude. Yeah, especially that 97 is pre-intimacy coordinators. For sure. Yeah. So he might've been Christian bailing a little bit. Yeah. Um, so uh, on the Jem'Hadar ship, Cisco is not handling the VR goggles well. He's struggling with migraines and nausea. Garrick, Knowing Cardassians handle the glasses better, offers to wear the other set and give Sisko a break, knowing that which is makes Garrick useful as always. Then they get attacked by a Federation ship. Bleh. They can't break. <laughs> I lost track of my word. They can't break cover, so they have to fight the ship, the Centaur, which looks a little bit like the NX-01, while trying not to kill their allies. They fight for a while, then they are rescued by three other Jem'Hadar ships. They chase the Federation ship off and get back on course. Back in Odo's I had, office... I had a, like okay. a, a rewrite here in my brain as it was happening, but... Yeah. I get what they're saying in the scene, but it's a little like, okay, you know, we can't kill our allies and they're trying to... Because we're in a hidden ship. I thought it would be kind of badass if it turns out that the Federation did that on purpose to sell the false flag. Clearly, we are not imposters because we're being attacked by the Federation. I thought that we were going to get that wrinkle in the writing, but oh, that would be that would be very clever. Uh, although I think they were going under the assumption that their their greatest chance at security was secrecy. Yeah, That's and once you true. add another el every element you add to it, mm -hmm. makes it more likely someone's going to find out. So I bet I bet the CIA does stuff like that all the time mm -hmm. where like the they have to sort of make difficult decisions about whether you know though i mean if that were the cover. case i mean it might be not prudent to bring along a super spy from the cardassian an ex-super spy from the cardassians along with you in this false flag but you know well but i do think i think at this point garrick has proven mm -hmm. that he he may not necessarily be aligned with the Federation, mm -hmm. but he's definitely not aligned with Dukat. Yeah, definitely doesn't have any, like, unexplained murders on his record. Oh, he's got unexplained murders all over the place. <laughs> but he's he's never going to be teaming up with Dukat or the Dominion mm -hmm. because he detests Dukat and the Dominion enemy of my enemy. his dad. Enemy of my enemy. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, back in Odo's office, Kira complains about Dukat and she convinces Odo to ask Wei-Yun to allow the Bajoran security officers back. She says, go to Wei-Yun. He'll listen to you. In his eyes, you're a god that gives you power. But what good is power unless you're willing to use it? Meanwhile, Dukat watches Wei-Yun hand out the Ketracel White. And this is... I, I love the Dukat Wei Yun relationship know, here. I know. It's, you know, it's a great episode, so we're talking a lot about it. But I have a. 
I had a wormhole that I've already filled for myself, and it's filled because it's great, great episode. My wormhole was like, duh, why wouldn't you utilize Odo's god status with Wayun way sooner? And the way that they did this with the bricks, Keith, the bag o' bricks, is, in my opinion at least, is they spent so much time with uh, emo Odo, right? Yeah. Odo's got so much baggage running. How uncomfortable fr- he is running from his founderlingness right? and running from any sort of attribution of that that he would probably he's probably and is portraying here. He's a he's sort of afraid. He's, he's sort reluctant of to, reluctant to reluctant yeah. to do it, and so it makes sense that he. But there is one person who convince him could convince him, right? And also, I think I'll fill it another way, and that is knowing he has this power, but also knowing he probably should save it for something important, mm-hmm. right? Because like you don't you don't want to overdo this power, you don't want to push your advantage, you want to wait for something that really matters before you do it, um, you know, and like not looking ahead. I'm like, is this really worth it? I don't know. We're going to find out. So, uh, but before Dukat and William discuss uh, him giving out the white, you enjoy that, don't you? The constant reminder that you're their masters. Weyun says the founders are the masters. I am merely their servant, as are the Jem'Hadar and you. That may be, but even amongst servants, someone has to be in charge. And Weyun says, I love this line. That's exactly the kind of observation I've come to expect from you, Dukat. Interesting, yet somewhat petty. Great. You think Odo let, enters? I guess it's it's crazy to me that Dukat is so short-sighted that he thinks that the Dominion Weyun is not going to just use him for their gain and then jettison him instantly the second they get what they want. Well, I, and I think that's where the malignant narcissism comes in. Yeah, right. And that he is he is so malignantly narcissistic that he believes that he has the upper hand when he doesn't. And I think he also is not a long-term strategic thinker. He is very much, I'm dealing with what's in front of me right now. I'm experiencing what's happening right now. Whereas Dukat is laying traps and, uh, not Dukat, uh, uh, Garrick is laying all these breadcrumbs and setting up these traps over years and years and years. Dukat strikes me as more like what's happening right in front of me is the only thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. Obvious parallels, obvious. So um, that, at least that's how I read it. He's like, I'm in charge now. It, I've always been in charge. I will always be in charge. Um, so Odo enters and talks to Wei Yun. Wei Yun immediately and emphatically gives Odo whatever he wants, including the Bajoran security, but he wants something in return for Odo to join him and Dukat on the ruling council of Deep Space Nine. Odo goes to Kira and she says, don't you see Wayun's using you? Your presence on the council validates the Dominion's control of the station. I thought we were using him. I know the dangers, Major. I've had to walk this line before, during the Cardassian occupation. I can do it again, but this time I won't be alone. I'll have you to help me. And she pats his hand and says, that's right, you will. I wonder too if in Odo's, the recesses of his mind, because we've seen it, right? He doesn't have a ton of control with the founders. Every time they link up, every time they goo, every time they get close, yeah. he can't resist. And that I'm sure is a little, gives him pause as well. Yeah, no, he is incredibly susceptible to that. Uh, I mean, it's he. Odo is such a complicated character, and like his, he he's also the most vulnerable character. And remember, Kira got up his his crawl before because Odo was given a position of power in the last occupation and chose to sort of turn Not the wield it, turn yeah. the other the cheek quite often. What what good is power if you don't wield it? So it's it's all yeah. all the chickens coming home to roost. Oof, it's so layered. So, uh, Cisco's ship arrives. Jimin, uh, Jimin this is ship. also my favorite thus far, and we're obviously we're in like a kind of a holding pattern. But my favorite incarnation of their relationship thus far, mm. just like understanding with so many, so much understanding. But 
true to the point of serials, unlike a next gen where I can just like pip and pop, if I just like saw this running, this episode running, I'd have absolutely no friggin' idea. Yeah, no, you cannot. You, you can you can pip and pop next gen. You cannot yeah. pip and pop Deep Space Nine. Uh, no, for sure. But yeah, I mean, it it makes sense that they're both kind of their best selves in the situation because this is what they grew up in. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a a resistance force in an occupied territory, an impossible. I I think they both operate better under those restrictions because it, it's it's in a lot of ways somebody like Odo struggles with every option in the world, struggles with freedom. He's much better with, give me, I can choose one of the two bad options. You know, give, give me give me two or three options, but if I have a million, I don't know what to do. Mm. And I think I think Odo is, is frequently a victim to that. So Cisco's ship arrives at the Ketrasol White facility on the asteroid and they wait, uh, in, in the drive-thru for an order of white. Their plan is to beam a bomb hidden in the empty canisters onto the asteroid. They successfully beam it down on a set to a short countdown, but then, uh-oh, the uh, facility puts up shields trapping them in where the bomb is gonna go off. They have 90 seconds to come up with a plan, and they realize that the bomb is going to blow up the shield generators but they'll be blown up if they're too close. So they have to time escaping to fly out just ahead of the blast, but not before the shields are down. And Bashir, of course, is able to do the math first, cause smart. I, so, you know, this is like sort of the action piece of this, which is not nearly as important as the world building, but I, I think it's a cool concept, mm -hmm. right? You're, you, you got a time from the blast, like I liked it storytelling wiles. But, unfortunately, it explodes early. And I wish we had an explanation as to why. Yeah. We just sort of accept that it blew up early, but Wor we don't know why. That was it. That's the wormhole in the episode. You're like, what? Like, it's sort of, it, it, it creates a false tension that, or a false ticking clock, false tension that is unnecessary because A, it would have been fine for the plan to just work, right? Or right. B, or B, they say that, oh, we're trapped, but then they're not trapped, and they like have to backdoor themselves and exit. Like, oh, the the, the blast that should kill us is actually gonna break the, the... It doesn't make any sense. Well, the, let the, let let him use his math brain. Because the only thing I can read is that yep. maybe they're saying that even the best math brain, even the best plan, even the best bioengineering can't prevent unplanned circumstance, unforeseen circumstances, right? I mean, I guess that's what we're saying, but it also gives you an extra explosion, I guess. Which, which, well, the explosion is going to happen either way. I, I, I agree with you. My rewrite would be because if we're going to do the thing and do the math and do all that, like, and then erase it and make it irrelevant, set up the situation as such that the math is going to prevent them from being vaporized, but they're still going to get their asses kicked by the explosion. Yes, that. That. And that way, both of those things matter, and you're not just mm -hmm. erasing a piece that you, you do all this thing and then just wipe it off the map. Um, there's no reason that there there's no reason to make it a a, a, a winnable thing. I, right? I make it an unwinnable situation. I 100. percent I mean, this is a super stuffed episode. I 100 percent think if they had another pass at it, they would yeah. do the exactly what we just said. And I'm sure upon rewatch, they sit down. And they're like, "Why well, should have just flipped it?" We find yeah. out that we're trapped, and we do the calculation that we have to do this to get. The, the from calculation the... saves our lives, right. but we're still going to get our ass kicked. Thus, setting up yeah. what we need to set up because they, you know, they, they needed to set up the, the ship is going to be crippled. Mm -hmm. They could have done that without erasing yeah. their plot point. Anyway, uh, giant explosion, boom! They get out, but they're crippled. And Cisco says, "How bad is it?" doesn't look good. I'm going to have to switch to auxiliary life support. Deflectors are down. The guidance system is shot. What is it? The core matrix is fried, which I'm assuming is their warp drive. We don't have it. Forgive my ignorance, but with that warp drive, how long is it going to take us to reach the nearest Federation star base? A long time, Mr. Garrick. How long? Sheer computer brain. 17 years, two months, and three days, give or take an hour. And we do not finish with a to-be-continued 
that is just implied because we have a dot 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 to end a time to stand Ooh. let's throw up some whatever we call this Okay, we have discussed wormholes. Mike, what was your best moment? Uh, there's so many good moments, but I have to go with Dukat Kira because it was mm. explosive. It was uncomfortable. It was sizzling. It was probably this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go hyperbole here, Keith. Okay. I would say in everything I've ever watched, I'll stick with television. In all of the TV, and this includes Breaking Bad, this includes my favorites. I think really? this might be in the top 10 of best bad guy scenes. Mm. Like, best, like, heel turns. Like, this is where he's, you know, they've done an excellent job of making the Ducat, at times, sympathetic even? Maybe a little could be on sure. like a, it, yeah. Is he a good guy? Because yeah. sometimes he's been a, he's been an ally. But here's the full heel guy. turn, and it's one of the best. It's just an incredibly uncut. What a ballsy scene to write and to perform and to put into an episode first episode back from the season break. Uh, so I have to pick it. It's I think it's frigging excellent. Mm. In a bad way, but in a great way. Oh no, terrifying! Yeah. It is it is a intensely uncomfortable scene. Mm. Um, and speaking of intensely uncomfortable, I can see I need to Photoshop a certain little uh, spark there because <laughs> I, I have a migratory mole on yeah, my forehead. I could I thought it was your, either your lens was messed up or no, it's the I, overlay. I literally rubbed my monitor. Maybe I had some goo on it. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> that was a coffee stain from a spit tape. Uh, all right, well, we're going to leave it for now. Uh -huh. But I don't have a mole. It's not a zit. I don't have a big old zit on my forehead. Uh, yeah, best scene for this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for the sake of difference, mm -hmm. right, I'm weirdly going to pick the Jake Wayoon scene yeah. about the Great press scene. and information and framing information and, you know, how the, the, the occupiers, ri occupiers write the story and so forth. Like, I, I just think it has so much prescience. Um, and uh, well, it was even, it, it was the post truth movement before the post truth movement. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I mean, post truth is is what we go through in cycles as as mm -hmm. a humanity, and uh, there's this sort of the eighty year cycle people talk about, where we uh, where we 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 recover from authoritarian monstrosity, and we're like we're never going to do that again, and we fix it. And then everybody who remembers it dies, and then we get sucked right back into it. And and it's like it's it's like we're in this moment as well. But on Deep Space Nine, we're sort of in that moment. Uh, so it felt like very like oh my god, crackling with relevance in that little scene there. Yeah, and and that ties to not to put them on blast. Back to that quark scene where he's like, well, it ain't that bad. It could be worse. And you're like. Which is also true. Yeah, and you're like, holy crap, you know? How often are you like, well, you know? Well, and and won't the, affect me. The, and the subtext to that, of course, is so far, right? And and the the you know the boiling of the frog that we're all going through. Well, it's not as bad as that. It's not as bad as that. Well, it's way worse than it was before. And when it got that bad, this was a step along the road, but we're not there yet. So clearly, you know, it, you're you're being hyperbolic if you make that mm -hmm. reference. If you if you draw that parallel, you're being ridiculous. Well, you know, we're we we find our way uh, almost pulling into the driveway before we realize. Oh wait, we've arrived. How many times do they do they ask the Supreme Court justices like, oh, what would you what do you think about this specific case law? And they're like, oh, well, press it. Oh, of we course, would never. We never. And then it's like never, never. First thing. <laughs> yep. Yep, we're, we we are all the frogs being boiled. Anyway, but this again, it just feels so. God, we're right there, and it's 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 uh, it's scary, but also tremendous television. Let's hand out some step balls. You get some step
Keith, you know I loved that season finale. Yeah. Loved it. In fact, I gave it a... 97. 97. I think this is better. I think this is a better episode because mm. not because the season finale has the built-in finality and right. so you get sort of an assist in the tension department because there's a weight implied. Yeah. Here, it is much harder, I think. It, yes, it's hard to write a season finale, but to write a, a show-stopping premiere episode Right. Knowing that you got to follow it up with twenty four episodes, twenty five episodes, I think that's a, t- a heavy lift too. Because you don't want to give too, you don't do too much, you don't want to do too little, right? And I think people are often overly cautious, or you introduce a whole, whole money, whole slew of new elements, cast this, that, that. This doesn't do any of that. It's like I know he knows exactly the story it's telling, and it does it with just superb, just excellence. The hardest part is the first five minutes, right? Because you have to give a bunch of exposition as to what's been going on. But the way they do it, because they split up Dax and Worf, so when they get back together, they're able to show the time, they're able to discuss what's been happening, and you get a little bit of insight. You get the status reports. So the intro, they nail it. The middle bit, where we're setting up the stakes at large and the tension betwixt the different relationships that is ongoing, but also a very specific sort of adventure we're going on this week mission and that is really interesting it's really and not only is it interesting but it's important in the grand scheme they've set up the pieces as to why destroying the white would be but it's also not one of these things where oh well we can win the whole thing for a while i thought oh destroying the catcher cell white will be how we win the whole thing but when they say oh it's right. one outpost and one little far little thing you're like oh yeah. shit this is huge they can't just blow up the white and it's gone no no we're we're just shaving off chunks and then the way the mission with the exception of that little wormhole the way the mission goes is very interesting i think it's fun it's but and also somehow seems secondary to the sort of awesome stuff that's happening on the station right the 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 relationship everything is great uh it has something to say it has questions to ask you and not force feed you the answer it is a little nihilistic it is a little dire it is a little dour yep yet there's elements of hope and of the heroes heroing and it's awesome that garrick though he's a little salty he's still feels like he's on our team now and we had to earn yep. win that and we don't have to so much of it is great i'm i don't know that i've ever been more excited to get back to <laughs> it yeah um if that was a 97 for me this is a 98.5 this is almost perfect. I absolutely think this is, we are firing on every cylinder possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are in the middle of one of the absolute best arcs of Deep Space Nine. And, um, you know, there, there's going to be several to come, but but it is it is such a, you know, and like I know how long this arc goes and you don't, but it is, it is immensely satisfying. And I, I, I'm trying to harken back to when I first saw this arc. No, oh, yeah. And um, and again, for those of you who didn't remember from before, I watched this for the first time on my iPod video on the train, on the subway between Brooklyn and Manhattan, going back and forth to work. Uh, and let me tell you, was on the on the on the on the four train under the six train and like that is pretty close to hell. Was NYU it's on the east cra- side? Uh, on the yeah on the on the I was on the lower east on the first and thirty first. I was going to. Um, so that that train ride is like about an hour from our old apartment, mm-hmm. right? It's pretty close to hell, riding that train. It is crowded. Yeah. It's ass in the morning. It's rush hour. Uh, it's slow it's angry it's it's like it, it was just like and at this half it was also like tense because this was like 2002 2003 so it was pretty soon after 9 yeah, 11 getting on the subway sucked for a while it was really tense and so it was awful and i was out there like doing my stupid office job and not acting or it was it but to go into to literally go into the the bowels of hell on the six train line like 
80 feet underground on this hot tunnel to have this little respite here. And I got so wrapped up in this entire galactic universe on a little screen that was like literally this big on the subway being jostled standing in an armpit mm-hmm. uh and to be so enveloped by this world uh it really just sucks me back right into that time and how unbelievably excited i was to get to the next i had them all I had the whole series on the op- get to the, get to the next get to the next one and it was um right now is when like you can just feel the momentum of the series you know like the the ball starts slow and it rolls and rolls and rolls and we are flying yeah. we are gonna go smash a town with this snowball uh and it's so exciting so yeah i think it's a i think it's an uh, a, a very good season opener um right in the meaty center my favorite parts of this show and uh you know, other than the little wormhole at the end, I don't have any real notes. The um, from a writing standpoint, the difficulty of re-racking all of this plot, all of these relationships, teeing up our way to move forward throughout this whole thing. So, you know, setting up these obstacles we're going to be battling with for who knows how long, um, and at the same time, being brave enough. We're not on the station. Yeah. Our heroes are not... It's a show called Deep Space Nine. Our heroes are not on Deep Space Nine. And if you thought we were going to put that in the box the next episode, we're not. Mm-hmm. Right? And we don't know how long... Freaking the Dominion is in control of Deep Space Nine! And what does that mean? And and time has passed, too. So, like, we have a, we've been gone so long, there is now a new normal mm-hmm. on Deep Space Nine. And it's occupied France in a lot of ways. And it is, like, occupied for a lo- long enough time that you sort of develop your new life in that situation. And that's crazy to think about. Awesome. Um, yeah, so awesome. So much fun. 96 self-sealing stem bolts from me. Uh, so IMDb, it's an 8.5, which makes this the 15th best episode of Deep Space Nine out of 173 Next week, we're going to be talking about Rocks and Shoals, which is just going to continue the story at this point. All right, um, let's do it. So, like, we're we're now, like, just breaking bad, right? It's just one long story, um, at least for a while, which is awesome. Thank you so much for watching and enjoying our nonsense. Thank you to the patrons who have joined us and supported us at patreon.com slash KNM. Thank you for being oh, patient. I'm sorry. For watching I'm so sorry. Oh, entertainment. Whoa, whoa, If you whoa. enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, <laughs> please I, I would, like you know, I would like to point out, I was thanking everybody for their patience. I hit the button. Which you cut me off and ended the show. I would like to thank everybody in the universe, except for Mike, for your patience to allow us to take a week off for Mike's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next week. See you then. Oh, that was Thank awesome. you for watching KM Entertainment. <laughs> if you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash KM. Speaking of intensely uncomfortable, I can see I need to Photoshop a certain little uh, spark there because <laughs> I, I have a migratory mole on yeah. my forehead.